All right, what we're going to talk about now is facade pattern. In all honesty, facade pattern is so simple that I'm not really sure how to turn this into a video, but we'll slightly diverge into the law of Demeter and hopefully that will be sufficiently interesting. If you didn't watch the last video, the last video was adapter pattern, now it's facade pattern, the next will be proxy pattern, and then we'll talk about the differences and the nuances between adapter pattern, facade pattern, proxy pattern, and decorator pattern, because they're often sort of uh, mixed up. But in this video we're talking about facade pattern, and facade pattern is really really easy. Here's the thing. If you've got a bunch of things, informally say that these represent classes, you have a bunch of different things and then you have a bunch of interactions between these different things. So this uses this and this uses this, but this one uses this one and this one actually also uses this one and this one uses this and this uses this and like this and like I'm just drawing arbitrary arrows, right? I'm trying to show that there's some level of complexity here, right? And then you've got a client, client, and as usual when we say client we don't mean client as in customer, we mean client as in a user of a particular piece of code. In other words, and not a user as in an end user, but a user as in a particular piece of code using another particular piece of code. So here's a piece of code that wants to use some pieces of this code. And the point is that this client wants to use wants wants to use this sort of these different pieces, right, in, in some particular manner. So let's. I mean, the reason that something might look like this is that we might have an extremely decoupled system, right? So this might actually be a very good thing. Probably not, like given this diagram. But but I'm trying to say that you can have um, lots and lots of classes, even though you have a high decoupling. Actually, I mean, my my spontaneous guess, if you have lots and lots of classes, would be that your system is highly decoupled because you have lots of classes that do lots of small things. Or sorry, I should say you have lots of classes that each do a very small thing. So single responsibility principle, right? Each of your different classes do one thing and one thing only. And if you keep following that principle, you'll end up probably with lots of different classes. Now, that means sometimes when we do this, depending on the complexity of the task, you might end up with lots of classes, A, and then B, having to use many, many classes in order to actually do anything meaningful. So there's an example in this book, Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software by Gang of Four. When they talk about facade pattern, they, they have this image of a compiler. So there are a bunch of pieces from a compiler, like a scanner, a parser, token, symbol, all of this stuff that you would uh, probably use if you were building a compiler. So in other words, a bunch of classes that you would probably use if you were building a compiler. In even other words, it would make sense to divide, to structure up your program in, in these different classes. In other words, it would make sense to, to separate things into these different classes, not necessarily partic these particular classes, but I'm emphasizing it would make sense to have this high level of abstraction it would make sense to separate to this extent. But, of course, when you do this, that means that in order to actually do any, any useful work, in, actual, in, in order to actually do any compilation of programs, or whatever the task is that you are modeling, it might mean that you need to use lots of different classes at the same time, which can actually get kind of hairy, which is exactly what we're looking at here, right? Like, so, so depending on how this is structured, right? Like, let's say that if this thing needs this thing, I'm not drawing UML now, so, so, so forgive me my sort of informal notation. If this thing is using this thing, but this thing is dependency injected, that means that in order to instantiate this thing, we needed to pass it one of these, right? So let's say, let's say that this is A and let's say that this is B. So in order to say new A, we need to pass it a new B, for example. But let's say that Bs actually require Cs, so <laughs> new C. But actually that doesn't work because C needs a reference back to B. Oh, okay, so maybe it's even something more confusing. So it's like we construct a B equals new B and then we're not passing C in the constructor but we're setting B. So we're saying like B as set and then we're setting the C because that when we've also constructed the C before so it's like C equals new C. No arguments, right? And then, and then on C we set B, right? So it's like that relationship, something along those lines. I mean, I, I'm just doing stupid stuff in order to show that depending on the scenario, you might have a lot of uh, difficult wiring, let's say, right? Like depending on your scenario, it might be, or depending on your model, it might be non-trivial to, to set up the data structures in the way that you actually want them set up in order to actually do any useful work. And that's fine. I mean, what we're saying here is not that 
that that's a bad thing. I mean, having highly decoupled systems is a good thing and having sort of complex setup might be, I, I would venture to guess, is almost a, a natural consequence of uh, having highly decoupled systems because you have uh, very general pieces that you compose together in order to do useful things. But because they are so general, they can be composed in a multitude of different ways, which means that you can do a multitude of different things. So, what is facade pattern? Well, facade pattern is a way of saying that, okay, it's fine that I need to do all of this complex wiring, but if I'm gonna do this complex wiring, I wanna have an easier way of doing it. And that's the facade. If you think about the word facade, the facade is the sort of exterior of the building, like, like the outside, the face of the building. And actually that's a very useful metaphor because Obviously, the house is a lot, lot more than just the facade. If you just had the facade, it would be completely pointless. You need all of the plumbing and the, well, I know too little about houses, but you would need all of the plumbing and the isolation and the foundation and the wiring and the roof and like all of all of that stuff. You need that stuff in order to, to, to actually construct a building. But then you also need the facade because you don't want to be looking at all of the plumbing. And that's exactly what this is. Uh, the facade pattern. With the facade pattern, we're saying underneath the facade, we have a lot of plumbing, this stuff. But outside, I don't want to have to deal with all of that plumbing all the time. So I'll create a facade, right? I'll create like a, a nice wrapper, a nice interface that I can interact with instead, like the face of the house. And that thing then interacts with all of this complex stuff that interacts with all, the, all of the wiring. So if we try to draw this, that means we have this facade here, facade, that the client interacts with. And then the facade does all of this stuff, right? It does all of the complex wiring, whether that be, whether that starts with uh, B and A and C or whatever that starts with. So I could draw a UML diagram, but really the, the UML diagram is just the same thing. It's, it's just this, it's just, a facade is a class that has some set of methods and what it does is that it invokes methods on, uh, I'll just put dashed lines here to indicate uh, that it could be any number of arrows here. It invokes methods on uh, a bunch of other classes who invokes methods on a bunch of other classes, etc., etc. I mean, this is not composite pattern. We haven't talked about composite pattern yet, but, it, but it's not composite pattern. It's, there's, not some, there's not some order to this madness. It's just madness. The, the thing that the facade is a facade over, that stuff isn't necessarily following any particular structure. This stuff is completely dependent on your scenario. Sometimes you have arrows going this way and sometimes you have arrows going this way and like it completely depends on your scenario. The point is that you construct a facade that interacts with these objects and simplifies the interaction for you so that when you have a client class, you can use this facade instead of having to directly interact with all of this stuff. And if you imagine that you have multiple clients, if you imagine that you want to do this complex interaction in multiple different places of your program, it would of course make sense to interact with only one piece instead of interacting with all of these different pieces. And that's really it. I mean, if you get that, you get facade pattern. So whenever you introduce a thing that you interact with, instead of interacting with a bunch of different complex pieces, you've essentially used the facade pattern. That simple. Now, if you're not already familiar with this playlist or channel, what we're doing here is that we're walking through all of the patterns in this book, Head First Design Patterns, one by one by one by one. And this is why we are now talking about facade pattern. Again, next time we'll talk about proxy and then we'll have a special video where we talk about the differences between facade, proxy, decorator, and adapter. And then we're back to the regularly scheduled program where we go through the patterns of this book. Now, if you're new to design patterns, I would highly recommend that you get this book, super pedagogical. It grows on me the more I interact with this book. I actually think it's kind of fundamental. I can really see why this has become sort of a course literature in a lot of courses, makes sense. Links are in the description. If you're not new to design patterns, I would rather say get this book instead, Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software by Gang of Four. So this is like the classic de facto design patterns book. So put this thing on your shelf and keep it as a reference for the future. If you're like me, why decide? Get both. They're really good books. You'll learn from both of them. Links are in the description. Moving on.
And actually, we're kind of done here. I just want to mention one thing before we move on. This headfirst book starts a discussion about the law of the meter. Law of the meter. Zip. And apparently, I didn't know, it's also known as the principle of least knowledge. So the law of the meter or the principle of least knowledge. In other words, the principle of knowing as little as possible. You can also think of it, I think it's often referred to as well as talk only to your immediate friends. Like objects should only talk to their immediate friends and not the friends of their friends because of coupling. If you couple to only your friends, that's less bad than if you couple to your friends and the friends of your friends. Think about it, coupling is bad because when we want to change things, it's very difficult to change because things are coupled. In other words, if I have this thing and I have this thing and this thing couples to this thing and I, I want to change this thing over here, then the first thing might have to change as well because this second thing has changed. In other words, when the class representing me couples to this class representing the pen, if the pen suddenly changes in some way, the behavior of the pen changes, then I might have to change because that change is not compatible with the way I was expecting the pen to work. And, and it's back to that old statement like the sort of the golden grail is, is uh, low coupling and high cohesion. But that's a discussion for some other time. So because because of coupling, law of the meter, or the principle of least knowledge, or talk only to your immediate friends, those are rules that are introduced as an attempt to make us reduce coupling. But what do they actually say? So in this book, there's this list of which methods are allowed to be invoked when you are trying to follow the law of the meter. And actually, this is quite interesting because I had learned it in a much more sloppy way. Let me just give you the sloppy way first. So the sloppy way is this, that you're only allowed to say a dot b and you, but you're not allowed to say a.b.c. So you're allowed to say a.b, but you're not allowed to say a.b.c. And that's sort of the, the naive explanation. Which means that you're allowed to talk to yourself, you're allowed to talk to things that you know, but you're not allowed to talk to things that things that you know know. You're allowed to talk to yourself, you're allowed to talk to friends, but you're not allowed to talk to friends of friends. And uh, I think this is summed up quite well in the statement that following this kind of logic leads to interfaces that are wider because if, if B is supposed to act on, the, on behalf of C uh, to A, that means that uh, B needs to kind of implement the interface of C if A wants something from C and B has C. So it's like instead of a calling B and getting back a C and then calling something on C, it's like A calls B who calls C and then gives something back to A, which might mean that B now has to broaden its interface. But, but I guess the point is that if that happens, that means that B has too much responsibility or something along these lines. But I really don't want to dig in here. I, I just want to point out that there is some controversy here. And if you're interested, please let me know in the comments and we'll definitely dig down here because I think there's probably a super interesting discussion here. I mean, it seems that this has more to do with types rather than and the number of calls or something along these lines. So you already know that I recommend you to get this book if you want to know more about design patterns. But if you're interested in the law of Demeter discussion, I actually think it's, it's a good idea to get this book as well. So when I said a.b.c, what they say is that they have this definition. They say that if you are in a particular method, in a, a particular object, you're only allowed to invoke some particular methods. It depends on where these methods uh, reside. Uh, imagine that you're in a method in, in some particular object. You're only allowed to invoke methods on the object that you're in or uh, objects that have been passed to you as a parameter. So you're in a, you're in a method, you've been passed some particular parameter and you're allowed to invoke methods on that parameter or Third point, you're allowed to invoke methods on object that you've created yourself. So if you're in this method and you've created an object, then you're allowed to invoke methods on that object that you created. And fourthly, fourthly, and finally, you're allowed to invoke methods on a component of this object, which means, for example, an instance variable. So if you're in a method and that method's in a class, and that class has been instantiated, and then you have an instance variable. You're allowed to invoke methods on that instance variable. But 
let's leave that aside. Regarding the facade pattern, I think we've nailed the facade pattern. The only thing missing, which I forgot before, is actually the definition. So the definition of facade pattern from headfirst design patterns. The facade pattern provides a unified interface to a set of interfaces in a subsystem. Facade defines a higher level interface that makes the subsystem easier to use, right? So the facade pattern provides a unified interface, that's the facade, which is used by a client, a unified interface to a set of interfaces, this set, in a subsystem. Facade, then it's like an explanation, facade defines a higher level interface that makes the subsystem easier to use. So it's not like it's adding additional functionality. It's just on a higher level. It's like we have all this complex stuff here and instead of interacting with that complex stuff, we have this higher level facade that we can interact with instead. And that's it. Beyond that, links to both these books are now in the description. You now know the facade pattern. If you don't, or if you found this confusing, or if you have anything you want to add or some examples or anything that you want to talk about, please absolutely shoot that in the comments. I'd appreciate it. I'm sure other people would appreciate it. Let's have a discussion. There's another video coming on the differences between decorator, facade, adapter, and proxy. Next video will be on proxy. We have lots of more design patterns to go, so subscribe to stay tuned. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.